is the plan on a we start broad oh we broadcast it yeah so uh i just need a signal when to start and then i'll introduce mark okay um let me admit librero and uh Conceição, and I guess you can start. <clears throat> okay. Do you are, do you want me to start now? Let's. Uh, okay, it's uh, six o'clock. I think we can start. Yeah. <laughs> right on time. Right. Very well, uh, dear online audience. Uh, my name is Otto Benavides. I will be the moderator for the following presentation at the response to the pandemic and future for education. This will be the second of five presentations. I submit in association with the Polytechnic Institute of Santarém uh, School of Education, uh, Portugal is very happy to offer the seminar week online. The Polytechnic Institute of Santarém School of Education has invited five outstanding speakers uh, to share with you current topics of education and technology. It has been ISIM's tradition to offer an annual conference in a selected country every year. Unfortunately, due the, to the current uh, worldwide health situation, the on-site conference was not possible. Therefore, we are offering this educational experience online. We would like to thank each one of the speakers who have graciously agreed to share their knowledge with you. Today, we have the honor to introduce Mr. Mark West, uh, who will discuss the EdTech response to the pandemic and futures for education for 40 minutes. At the end of uh, his presentation, the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, please type your questions in the chat box. Questions will be answered in the sequence order uh, until the time allocated for this session expires. Thanks for your participation. And thank you to the Polytechnic Institute of Santarém School of Education in Portugal uh, for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, Mark West works uh, uh, in, in UNESCO in the education sector. Uh, he has done a, a lot of uh, work and uh, has written many reports and done several missions with UNESCO. Uh, he is a good friend of ISIM and uh, from time to time, uh, I'd like to embarrass him. So if, if uh, you don't mind, I am going to share just a little thing, uh, a, a little bit of uh, an event that Mark participated in. Here he goes. Thank you. I'm gonna give us some turbulence. Huh? <laughs> 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 so he, he is a true uh, pilot, uh, and uh, so now he has even that experience. He is flown in the air. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, uh, Mark, uh, anytime uh, that you're uh, ready, you can uh, start. You can share your screen and uh, start the presentation. Thank you very much uh, to the audience, and thank you, Mark, for being part of this event. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Otto. And if I had known you were going to show that clip, I would have uh, worn my aviator sunglasses. That was that was not embarrassing <laughs> at all. Looks like I'm flying a Boeing, Boeing airplane. It, um, was Boeing, it was a Boeing 777. <laughs> that's right. Uh, a new one, a big one. Um, and that for, for everybody was uh, the last in-person ISOM conference, which we had in uh, at the University of Memphis in, uh, in Tennessee in the United States. And uh, anyway, a real pleasure being here. And thank you very much uh, to, to the university organizers in Portugal. Um, always a pleasure to, to speak with, uh, with an organization and, and a, a group of people so committed to finding ways to make technology work for education. Um, Otto mentioned that ISOM is, is, uh, is, is a friend of UNESCO. And, and uh, again, UNESCO considers ISOM a very close friend. Uh, we have both, both of our organizations have been working uh, for over 70 years uh, to understand how uh, technology can be leveraged for education. Um, in the 1950s, we were working on TV and radio. In the 1980s and 90s, we were 
working on PCs and, of course, mm -hmm. mobile technologies in the 2000s, and now beginning to look at some frontier technologies, AI and other things. Uh, but anyway, have really appreciated ISOM's uh, input and expertise in this as we work together, yes. really understand how to, how to make these technologies work for education. Clearly, this was an important concern uh, in 2019 and 2018, but obviously the pandemic has made this uh, of sort of absolute paramount importance. Uh, urgency around how to figure out technology for education uh, has just gone through the roof. Um, we, UNESCO, have been working nonstop on the COVID-19, the school closures, and what a difficult transition that has been to sort of make this hard pivot from in-person schooling to uh, learning at home uh, via technology. And so we need to really put all of our heads together to understand how uh, this, can, this can work. We, I think people with uh, expertise in this space, the ISOM community, not particularly surprising that this, uh, this, this shift, this U-turn to technology, did not go as smoothly as we might have, have hoped. There are many gaps, many issues need to be figured out. A lot of people lack training and capacity. And so the important thing is though, there are some real lessons that I think we can draw from the pandemic and we'll have a chance to talk about uh, some of those lessons, uh, some of those lessons today. Uh, I'm also very pleased that taking note of those lessons, UNESCO has, spent a lot of time documenting some of what went wrong and a lot did go wrong uh, and we can we can be clear-eyed about it um, some things did did go well though um, and we also have lessons we can draw from that but UNESCO has worked to sort of take stock of what occurred and then to provide a sort of roadmap for how we might go forward and uh, we have worked to put something forward to establish some normative understandings about how to integrate technology in education and basically how to make connected technology work for education. Um, and we're calling this a global declaration on connectivity for education. The sort of uh, shorter term for this is the rewired declaration. Uh, it's being called the Rewired Declaration because we're going to launch uh, and endorse this declaration at a major conference uh, being hosted in Dubai uh, with the UAE and uh, our partner for this project, Dubai Cares. So Dubai Cares has very generously underwritten this work that we've been pursuing for really the past year and a half to understand um, what sort of principles and commitments can be a, a sort of guiding light for countries, for, for school districts, and even for individual schools when it comes to making connected technologies work for education. So we'll have a chance to really dig into that declaration because uh, we want your feedback. We want your ideas on what you like, what you don't like, what's maybe missing that should be there, things we can sharpen or clarify. Um, so we are treating this event as a genuine consultation uh, to get feedback on, on this declaration. We still have scope to change the declaration. It's a malleable document. It's not yet written in stone, uh, and we will do so. We're taking good notes and listening. we'll be listening to you um, towards the end of, this, uh, end of this session to get your, your thoughts and ideas and then we'll take those to improve and refine the declaration itself. Um, so with that sort of direction, I did want to just sort of zoom out a little bit and give us a few, uh, just sort of signal some of uh, UNESCO's important work in the field of technology and education, uh, and also some of our upcoming work. So Alina, if you don't mind, maybe we can uh, look at a few of these things. So. The first one is this was a, just a newly uh, issued report, but looking really closely at the implications of AI for education. We know there are so many reports on what to expect around AI, but this really zooms in on its implications for education. And we put forward a number of uh, policy guidelines that we think will be very helpful uh, for our member states, uh, the countries that we work with but also for um, many others in education, uh, including people at uh, universities 
uh, and elsewhere. Um, then we will also, this uh, coming, uh, this November will be a major milestone for UNESCO because it will, uh, is expected, the countries uh, that, that consist of UNESCO are expected to endorse um, a recommendation on the ethics of AI. This will be the first attempt to put forward normative principles around ethics for AI. This document is not specific to education, but it, it mentions education a lot and talks a lot about the uh, educational implications of AI. So this will be, uh, as, we, as we expect, the world's first sort of uh, normative recommendations on ethics for AI and uh, hopefully points us in more responsible directions on how to use AI uh, in various fields, but obviously that this is coming from UNESCO, specifically in education, uh, science, and culture. Um, so a couple of things to look out for, the AI and education guidance for policymakers, this is already published, and the recommendation uh, on ethics of AI expected to be endorsed next month, but the text is already out there um, and being circulated. So um, if you're curious, uh, can take a look. Uh, next slide, please, Alina. Some of our forthcoming education work, uh, we have a, a flagship report about the future of education coming out uh, on November 10th. Uh, this is in conjunction with the uh, UNESCO's General Conference. So this is held once every two years. Uh, countries and ministers of education from around the world meet at UNESCO. Um, so this is a, a major report, and we're looking at uh, looking towards 2050 and what education can do to help us to build better uh, and more sustainable futures. Um, also, uh, towards the very end of this year, we will be putting out a report that really backs up and looks at what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic and the shift to ed tech. Uh, we're we're positioning this as a as a tragedy to the sense that. Um, it did not fulfill expectations, despite, uh, you know, tremendous work from a lot of different people. You know, we saw that, that the shift to ed tech uh, really widened a lot of divides that had existed before the pandemic and um, sort of heightened inequality in education and also, frankly, excluded uh, huge numbers of students. We'll have a chance to speak a bit more about that publication. And then finally in December is the launch of the declaration that I mentioned, the Rewired Declaration. And this is again, our attempt to sort of help establish a new orientation and a new approach uh, to using connect te connected technologies for education. Uh, thanks a lot, Lelina, and next slide, thank you. So a little more on this, um, I'm gonna just zoom in on those three things we talked about, a little more on the, the futures of education work. So. This work um, is being steered by international commission. That commission is chaired by the president of, uh, of Ethiopia. And it is basically lo looking at ways that education can help us build a better future. So while many reports about education look at sort of the, the hows and ways to improve efficiency and ways to improve quality, this report really backs up and looks at the whys of education. What is the purpose of this whole enterprise? What might the purpose be? What could the purpose be? What should the purpose be uh, of education? And then going from that, what should be the organization of education and the processes of education? And this report really points out uh, some things that I think are very important. One is it, it points out that we have an education system that is clearly not working for us in terms of sustainability. Some of the work coming from different UN bodies and other international organizations on what's going on with the climate uh, and uh, also with um, you know, mass extinction of, of different uh, biological life forms, you know, very, very frightening. And why is it that education is not leading us to greater sustainability? Um, and this report really spends a lot of time kind of grappling with some of those questions. It also has a section that deals a lot with, uh, with technology and sort of uh, the relationship between education and technology. And it, it speaks too to some, some emerging problems, uh, uh, polarization uh, that we're seeing around the world, 
uh, and also the sort of great, you know, the many uncertainties surrounding the world of work and how to prepare people uh, for, you know, productive, uh, productive careers, as well as preparing them uh, for, for life and, and society. Uh, next slide, Elena. This report falls within a, a sort of long tradition. UNESCO has, has produced these uh, visioning reports about the future of education every 25 years or so. So in 1972, we had the four report, uh, Learning to Be. This was a sort of seminal report. It was read uh, in education schools around the world. And again, really looked at, you know, what should education be doing? That was uh, again in 1996, the, the Delors report. Uh, led by Jacques Delors, uh, again looked at sort of uh, looked at education again a very different moment in the 1990s, um, and decided that sort of announced that there were four pillars of education. Again, many people who've been through any sort of education training recognize these four different pillars. So, Alina, next slide, please. So, this report is our update to this. And uh, rather than being sort of chaired again by a, a French man, it was uh, chaired by the president of Ethiopia. Uh, she's been really hands on with this uh, with this report and helping to steer this and I think some really innovative directions. Um, next slide, please, Lena. Oh, sorry, Lena, if you can go back one more slide, excuse me. I just wanted to say also that the, the Futures of Education report calls for a new social contract for education. So understanding that education while based in in laws and you know legal organization and other things and, and formal structures education is also based on many informal understandings what parents and people expect education to do what they expect from schools and teachers uh, what schools and teachers expect from students how people interpret their sort of work and so at the heart of this report is a call to sort of rethink that social contract and again to move us in directions that might allow us to achieve greater sustainability, greater inclusion in education, greater equity, and we also hope uh, or greater quality to ensure uh, human thriving and, and human well-being. Um, so that's that's coming up in, in November. Um, nobody's seen this report. We've sort of held it very tightly and uh, again will be released um, uh, just, just in about a month's time, actually three weeks. Uh, next slide, Alina. I wanted to speak a bit more about this report. I know that this obviously speaks very much to the, the ISIM community. So what we did is we really scanned the globe to understand what happened when schools shut down totally unexpectedly um, and then pivoted to technology. And by unexpectedly, I wanted to say that as part of our, our work on the future of education, we in, in mid 2019, we came up with a survey about threats to education. And we literally had, I'm not joking, probably a half day brainstorm with education experts across UNESCO to come up with, with, with what we thought were the most prominent threats to education. We came up with all sorts of things. We had a super long list. We sort of carved the list down. Guess what was not there at all? Pandemic. <laughs> So, I mean, it also shows you how unknown the future is, if you know what I mean, and how unpredictable it, it, it can be. Um, but we, we, didn't, we did not expect or anticipate that. It's, a, it's embarrassing to say with, with hindsight. Um, but anyway, so this totally unexpected shift, schools closed down around the world, and all of a sudden ed tech is you know, in the spotlight, it's on, it's, it's sort of the only recourse to help students uh, remain connected to education. And so we really looked at how, how that went, you know, how, how that went in, you know, the, the, the richest neighborhoods in, in, in Paris and London and New York and Hong Kong and, and uh, Singapore to, you know, what also happened in, you know, very poor rural areas in India and Bangladesh and in uh, places like Sudan, I mean, really tried to understand, you know, what what happened and what that meant for students. Um, what we concluded was that when schools closed, uh, frankly, most learners were left behind. A shift to ed tech for most uh, students in the world, a majority of students in the world, meant just frankly a hard stop to formal education. So people who had been receiving some type of formal education in schools 
that simply stopped and there was no ed tech. The, for, even, even for people who did have ed tech, the, the, the paper makes a case that even when sort of ed tech was available and there, it, it didn't work as it was expected to, to the extent that it might provide equal opportunities uh, for students. We saw again and again, regardless of, of a country's level of development, that inequalities uh, were supercharged. And this had a variety of reasons, which, uh, which, which the book goes into. Obviously, unequal access to technology is part of it, but also simply a lack of uh, skills that people had, uh, digital skills that parents had, and simply relying on, on parents and, and the home to be a educa an educational space you know, different families had different uh, availability to assist with education. And so we really dive into, into this. We speak about the ways education really narrowed to curricular learning and how education in schools is really about uh, social and civic learning. It's about learning to be with peers. It's about learning to be with adults who are outside of your family. It's a lot about socialization, a culturalization. Uh, the space of the school is a, is a tremendous asset for learners of language uh, who may speak a different language at home than the language spoken in a society. Um, and that uh, re really changed uh, as part of the shift to um, educational technology. So the sort of narrowing of what education is um, um, changed. We talked about the unhealthy immersion into technology. Um, you know, around the world, people were being asked to spend, uh, you know, up to six hours a day in front of devices, uh, you know, sort of mirroring the school experience. But, uh, you know, is that, a, is that a good decision? And what were students doing when they were online? I think some people saw this sort of uh, leak of Facebook documents, but what really caught my eye was Facebook's own internal documents were targeting that uh, teenagers, including young teenagers, they're target time for those people to spend on Instagram per day was between two to three hours. That was the corporate goal, um, you know, of one platform. There were many other competing platforms, you know, competing for the eyes of, of teenagers and young people, understanding that once you hook in a young person, you sort of, they're likely to become, you know, longer term users of, of, a, of a particular application or a particular utility. Uh, so we do talk about this sort of immersion in technology. It also entailed a lot of health uh, problems. Um, we saw instances of in, in very wealthy countries where the closure of schools coincided with an a increase in obesity and diabetes, whereas the opposite problem in, in uh, developing in poor countries where schools had been a site of nutrition um, and uh, you know a healthy, a nutritious meal, and when schools shut down, Obviously, there was no technology equivalent for a meal, and uh, many people were, were undernourished uh, during the pandemic. We spend a lot of time in the report looking at this sort of shift to public to private control, and we observed that when technology, uh, when education moved to technology, the ways, you know, so many different layers of privatization. So suddenly the sort of the, the devices themselves were often, you know, produced by private and, and commercial for-profit companies. But then the, the sort of network, the way that education was beamed out or teachers could work with students was also, you know, controlled by, um, you know, network operators. So whether those are mobile providers or providers of, uh, of, of internet, but then even the spaces of education were often corporately controlled, whether those were synchronous meetings on Zoom or meetings on platforms like Microsoft Teams or Skype, you know, those were proprietary uh, proprietary spaces. Um, and the sort of platforms themselves where people would find resources, places like uh, Google Classroom or other comparable sort of applications and utilities uh, also tended to be commercially held. And we talk about how that became very problematic. There was a lot of evidence during the pandemic that teachers wanted different functionality from some of these platforms um, and those were not necessarily delivered, often because there was no formal contract between uh, education providers and the platforms they were using. The platforms were ostensibly free, but what that meant was that it was hard for people in the education community to ask for changes or insist on changes 
in some of those spaces. Um, we talk about issues around surveillance and control. Um, we talk about how EdTech, you know, allowed for sort of unprecedented levels of surveillance where you would have, you know, teachers being able to see everything from the number of keystrokes people enter. I don't know how many of you have ever seen what's capable of the back end meeting of a Google Meets meeting, but you can see the uh, the, the you know the voice activity the that was the, the the power put into the microphone of a student. I mean it really allowed for an incredible amount of you know sort of data. How much of that is useful for educational purposes is a is an open question. Um, so sort of new concerns around surveillance that had existed obviously prior to the pandemic, but really heightened during the pandemic as a lot of education and learning moved into the home. We talk also about issues of, of control and sort of who was in control of these platforms. We talk about issues where, you know, in the past to eject a student from a class was, uh, you know, it took some work. Uh, if I wanted to throw uh, Otto out of my class, you know, Otto might be able to, uh, to object and say, no, you know, Mr. West, I, you know, I didn't do anything wrong or he would have some recourse or there would be peers involved, but when education shifted over to technology, all it took to throw auto out of the class was a you know a click of the button. Uh, so anyway, these sort of very you, interesting you would do that. Thank I would you. never, I would never do that. Auto is going to throw me out of this meeting right now. <laughs> um, but again, somebody is in in control of our meeting here and can let participants in or out or mute me or mute somebody else. It's a you know it's quite quite a lot of control. And you know what does that mean to the sort of democratic space uh, for education? So you know some really interesting, you know, questions that arose. We talk about the right to education too A around the world. For instance, the the right to education is inscribed in various legal frameworks at the level of countries, but in almost all countries, the right to education, the sort of core element of the right to education, is a school day. So for instance, I'm speaking to you in France. In France, the law prescribes that students receive a certain number of school days per year, and there should be a certain number of school days per week and per month and per year. And the state has an obligation to deliver free and compulsory education for that number of days. Well, when education shifted to ed tech, what was a school day? It wasn't very clear. Um, and by putting content up on a platform that students might go grab or having a few trying to have a few synchronous classes where maybe a third of the class would show up did that did that constitute a, a fulfillment of the right to education was the state meeting its legal obligation interestingly the right to education says nothing about schooling being an in-person experience it's always been assumed that you know the right to education was inscribed uh, almost you know over 50 years ago um so wh what does that you know what does it mean now that there's this possibility to have education that involves no human contact or can be conducted entirely through sort of uh, digital and electronic means um so some real questions to sort of be answered there and and questions like should people have a right to unconnected education for instance you know, we see around the world different social services moving to online platforms and everything else. I think uh, I'm an American citizen, and I think now in my state, which is Colorado, if I want to renew my driver's license, I have to do it online. I don't think I, I, I could be wrong, but I'm not entirely sure there is an option to try to renew my driver's license without have, without doing it online. It. it could education be moving in that way? It, do people have a right to unconnected education? I don't want to use the internet or I feel that my students should you know, be able to experience schooling as an in-person experience. These are all sort of issues that need to be ironed out. And you know, they've been in the background before, but COVID really brought them to the surface in a big way. And in some ways, I think, you know, as as terrible and tragic as this pandemic has been and, you know, for education in particular, it has given us a preview of a lot of the questions that are going to be coming up in the next five years and the next 10 years and the next 15 and 20 years that I think, you know, we we suddenly saw them with a lot more clarity and we would be wise to begin acting on them and making intentional decisions where during COVID what we saw was a lot of 
ad hoc decisions, people just simply trying to stay afloat. Frankly, a lot of very bad habits, you know, were sort of quickly adopted and scaled up during the pandemic. But now, hopefully, as this pandemic continues to uh, sort of dissipate, thanks to vaccines and other things, you know, can we be more intentional about this, you know, shift, this digital transformation of education? Uh, finally, we, we get into some of the nuts and bolts purchases. What during the pandemic, you saw an unprecedented number of, uh, of purchases of electronic devices by school systems that could afford them. There were, you know, Herculean efforts to distribute uh, devices, connected devices to families that didn't have them, to learners that needed them, we didn't always come with digital skills training, but, you know, whatever, without question, there were a whole lot of devices that were purchase manufactured and that of course means you know the mining for the materials and you know what becomes of all of these uh, devices and many education systems have no real plans of how to recycle or to reuse or to replace these devices as they break or malfunction and we like to often consider you know the shift to educational technologies is you know more and more people getting access more and more people you know being connected and it's sort of this straight linear path but actually, when you look more closely at education, it's not that at all. You see all the time places where they had some connectivity or a school was connected or they had a computer lab or a lot of even individual students had connected technologies. And then those connected technologies become obsolete. They break uh, the, 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 the fiber that was connecting the school is, is broken and the school doesn't come back online. It's not a straight path. We see all the time that people teachers, learners, students that have been connected become disconnected or other things. So how do you ensure this is a more sort of sustainable kind of path? And, you know, in this, we also asked about, are there new rights? If education is going to be moving to connected technologies and education is a right, is there also something such as a right to, to connectivity? Um, is that also sort of an obligation for the state to, to fulfill that type of right? And what that, what might that look like? So some really fascinating questions. Um, and we do use this frame of tragedy to help, you know, also to help put a different spin on this. We were very surprised that a lot of people in the education community, I think a lot of people sort of, you know, a lot of money in ed tech and other things were really talking about how ed tech had saved the day, you know, that the Titanic was sinking and there were, you know, you know, ed tech was a lifeboat. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but you know, it it was there and it it helped a lot of people and there's there's some truth to that narrative um but this this publication also looks and and says that there were some some other things that have not been so great about that sudden shift to technology and even argues for instance that you know a lot of things we got when when we sort of floated some ideas in this report was you know what if this had happened in the 1970s what if this had happened in the 1990s you know the shift to, you know, there would have been nothing, nobody would have learned anything. We look at evidence to suggest that actually quite a lot of learning happened in places where there was no ed tech. You know, the families uh, often just took kids under their wing and they were helping out with work, they were helping out around the house, they learned to cook, they learned to do other things. And that this shift to sort of, you know, sitting and watching a teacher with no digital pedagogical experience you know, give a give a lecture with no audio visual materials or supports. Was that really educative um, or would, would playing with siblings have been more educative or simply watching TV, uh, for instance? Um, and we do note that some some poor countries sort of admitted to themselves initially that the connected technology what solution wasn't going to work and just went straight to TV, sort of Mexico being a, a prominent example um, and that the during that time, students actually did feel that they were part of a community because everybody was watching the same educational TV, often at the same time during the day, whereas students following sort of connected digital learning, that was often positioned as, you know, the personalization of learning and you're going to be following your unique educational journey. And that often became very isolating for some uh, for some students. Um, so anyways, again, uh, something that <laughs> I've had my head in for the past uh, past year, but I think there's so many important lessons to draw from this uh, from this pandemic uh, that can help point us in more productive directions going forward. And the report does have that. It does 
talk about sort of what is what is needed in light of uh, what we've learned um, through this uh, through this pandemic experience and this just totally un unprecedented, unexpected uh, shift from schools to educational technologies. And I think at core, the report is also a defense of, of schools as a, as a place where young people meet. It's not the home, it's not the street. Um, it's a, you know, it, it is a sort of un unique space uh, that serves a unique uh, social purpose. Um, so enough on the on our ed tech tragedy. I'll now transition into a little bit about our declaration, and then uh, leave you know time for uh, for for uh, some questions and, and answers. Um, so, uh, so this th this declaration again, it's it it wants to help take some of these lessons we just spoke about, some of these these findings and experiences, and sort of establish some shared understandings about what what direction should we move with all these digital technologies are changing our lives in so many ways and they're certainly changing teaching and learning so what should be our kind of guiding orientations our, our clear principles and we we propose three and i'm going to just sort of walk us through them and this is the heart of the declaration and lena if you don't mind if you can put the uh the website of the where we have the text of the declaration it's no secret kind of what we're what we're doing sorry lena next slide i'll it's okay we'll take it from the next slide yeah this just to say that this declaration is the result of a real rich consultation process it was steered by an advisory group uh these are the advisory group members but uh 22 different sort of experts in 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 ed tech uh, coming from different un organizations but also civil society groups teacher groups uh private sector representative representatives so we really wanted this to reflect a lot of different opinions uh, next slide alina and we're now going through this sort of consultation process where we're meeting with uh, all the different regional groups um for unesco's member states so uh, for instance, later this month, we'll be meeting with, uh, you know, the group of Arab states, we'll be meeting with uh, the group of the group of states from Asia, from Latin America, and presenting this, uh, this text, getting their feedback on it, and then taking that feedback on board and probably making adjustments to it. But just to say we're consulting with lots of different groups, not only governments, uh, but but civil society organizations, researchers, youth, uh teachers and other kind of key stakeholders uh, in this process and we also want to consult with you of course um so if we can get the next slide alina great so again i'll just move through the move through our principles so there, there are three principles and then some underlying commitments so principle number one is center the most marginalized and i know that doesn't sound like anything particularly novel, but that definitely did not happen during the pandemic. During the pandemic, the student that was centered was the student that was already connected, the student that already had digital skills. Uh, that was the student that was reached, and that student was often already privileged in a variety of different ways. So if we want to have any hope that a shift to connected technologies or you know, the increased digitization of, of education you know, can increase opportunities for all and not just lead to greater sort of polarization of opportunity, uh, we really do need to think about ways to, to center the most marginalized. How is this going to work for a student who doesn't speak the language of instruction? How is this going to work for a student whose family has no digital skills or very low literacy skills? How is this going to work for a learner who may be a refugee and not have a, not have a you know, not, not even have a, a stable home environment at all? Um, doesn't have a place to, to store things. You know, those issues need to be really thought through. They were not uh, through very well with rare exception during the pandemic. And so how can we begin to center the most marginalized? And we argue that if you center the most marginalized, then you have the possibility of coming up with models that are going to be more inclusive and more equitable. And will also work, of course, for people, you know, who are very privileged um you know but but also be working for people who are facing different types of disadvantage um so the commitments under this are just to ensuring that the connectivity does reach all learners uh our estimates were the connectivity again when you really looked at the sort of fine-grained numbers that it didn't even reach half of the learners in the world 
this wasn't just because of connectivity. Most people were covered by some sort of network. It's, it's almost well over 95% of the world is covered by some sort of pretty decent quality network. The problem arose with devices, with you know the, the plans and the SIM cards. And, and during the pandemic, the devices, just because a family even had two computers at home, it didn't mean the students or young children were able to use those devices uh, for education. Um, we talked about the importance of sustainable financing for connectivity for education. This tends to not be a straight sort of budget item anymore in countries. When you look at this, this is something that sort of gets really funded one year and then, you know, that's just sort of a one off and let's connect those people and then we don't have to spend so much money. It's not true. It's just like the maintenance of the physical infrastructure of education. It's going to require uh, consistent and sustainable financing to ensure this connectivity for education. Um, we talked, we, we talk also about these commitments to assure affordable options. And this gets into the thing that we, we see a barrier to connect connected education is just the sheer complexity around, uh, around connectivity options. I don't know if any of you have ever shopped for a, a, a mobile, uh, a mobile plan recently, but I have in Paris and I was sort of, you know, presented with, <laughs> I don't know how many options, I think 30 or something, you know, that could be this and this much data and this many free talk minutes and this many, you know, it was really baffling and confusing. And so can we sort of uh, ask countries to come up with sort of very clear cut options for connectivity for education where there becomes a kind of, you know, I have a kid, they need to learn through connected technology, what's the bread and butter, you know, plain plan that will allow me to do that without all this uh, endless complexity, fee structures and other things. Um, and finally, we, we say that we hope that connected technology will not lead to an underinvestment in the you know, physical infrastructure of school and schooling as an in-person experience. We hope it becomes a both and proposition rather than a sort of either or proposition. Uh, next slide, Alina, thank you. Principle number two is, is there needs to be good content. And we saw during the pandemic that, you know, even if you had a great connectivity, you had a you know really a, a good quality device and everything, it didn't mean there was so much out there for you. We were really baffled by how few countries just had, you know, any digitized educational content that was aligned with the curriculum. I mean, that would seem to be a very basic step, and many countries simply did not uh, did not have that available. So, for instance, what that meant on the ground is you have a a student who's in seventh grade studying math and studying science, studying geography. And it wasn't clear where you would go to uh, help help your your um, your your son or daughter uh, get information uh, about those uh, different subjects. What there was was this sort of hodgepodge of different options. You know, teachers sort of slapping things together, and you know, you go over here to this YouTube channel for this, and you jump over here to this other platform for that. There was no real front door for education. And this declaration really makes an argument that there needs to be a sort of public, public digital space for uh, connected education, just as there's a, a public space for uh, in-person uh, schooling. The providing differentiated educational resources, again, during the pandemic, uh, you know, parents very quickly learned that there was not, you know, not information, not really information for them. Uh, on how to support the learning of, uh, of, of dependents. We also saw that uh, teachers didn't, you know, didn't have, you know, necessarily very good information about their students and their learning. There wasn't like clear platforms for, for them. And so we hope that as this sort of develops, that that be, be really thought of and, and kept uh, front of mind. Uh, that different stakeholders need sort of different entry points um, for, to support education. And then the other idea is monitoring its adaptation. We saw a lot of instances where governments would sort of quickly throw together some digital content, put it out there, and then we'd ask questions about how's it being used, when's it being used, who's using it. They didn't have this information. I mean, this is a lesson to learn from you know commercial providers. No commercial provider doesn't look at this data. You know, they're looking at everything. You know, how many people, how many people pinged us today? How long was the engagement? How long did people spend on this screen, on that screen? And obviously that data can help to build better educational resources and tell you what people are using, what people aren't using and help uh, begin to 
you know, give clues as to why that might be the case and how you might be able to encourage different use and other things. So there really does need to be this sort of constant uh, monitoring and learning happening uh, from, you know, what, what you're seeing on these uh, digital platforms and utilities. And finally, principle number three, um, this is about that what we saw again and again during the pandemic is that the switch to, you know, a digital environment. I mean, think of how different this environment is than a sort of an in-person space. We often just replicate the in-person space. I, I think even webinars are guilty of this. You know, we, we pretend like we're in a, in, a, in a normal lecture hall and sort of do the usual thing. But teachers did the usual thing as well. Um, they went and, you know, gave sort of lectures and, you know, did not adjust their pedagogy, uh, except in rare instances, um, to, you know, take advantage of some of the things that digital learning offered, but also to, yeah. to avoid some of the pitfalls. Excellent. Uh, other commitments here, you know, to ensure that this strengthens the social and civic dimensions of learning. As we mentioned during COVID, what you saw, what you saw over and over is that, um, you know, education was sort of stripped down to academic learning. I mean, achievement and reading, achievement and math, and it became very narrow and all this other sort of magical stuff that can happen in the space of a school, not to say it always happens, but that just sort of went away. Are there ways we can use the digital space to, uh, you know, help people learn to live together, to help, uh, you know, students really build rich friendships and to, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, practice different habits that are common in a culture, you know, that seemed to be sort of, a, that, that aspect got sort of totally ignored. And so it'd be great to see some innovation on how to use these digital spaces for civic and social uh, learning. Um, we needed commitments for student and educator data. This went out, this went out the door in the emergency context of the pandemic. Uh, we saw again and again that there were very sort of loose, you know, regulations were not really in place before the pandemic about what, you know, how you manage student uh, and educator data. And uh, during the pandemic, there were, you know, all sorts of practices that, um, you know, on close inspection can be very troubling. And we're looking towards a future where, you know, a, a student who's starting school today might realistically have a super fine grained learning profile, you know, their score is on everything from how they did in, you know, their reading assessment first and second grade. I mean, even week to week, or you know, their completion on digital platforms, and all of that is being logged in some sort of uh, dossier that that is the dossier that's carried, you know, carried through their life. And you know, who 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 can use that dossier? And you better believe that employers are going to mine those those dossiers. And where does it stop? You know, if if I'm an employer and I suddenly learn that, you know, look, students who didn't do so well in second grade math, you know, we, we believe they're not going to perform at this company. And so, you know, auto, I mean, picking on you again, but, you know, auto did a great job in, in math and higher education and even in secondary school. But, you know, these scores in, in second grade are very concerning and, uh, you know, we're not going to hire him. We're going to hire this other candidate and maybe not even tell auto what, you know, what the reason is. But, you know, who, who gets that data, who can request that data, uh, we really need to think through this because there is so much data. And what should be the longevity of that data? I was <laughs> reflecting that I'm, I mean, the, the place where I went to middle school doesn't even exist in my small town in Colorado. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are just zero education records. I mean, even if I went to enormous lengths to try to achieve them, I don't think I, I don't think I could really get my hands on them. And maybe that's what we need, some sort of phasing out. I mean, this, you know, aligned with this sort of right to be forgotten, you know, this uh, terrible year of school that somebody had in fourth grade, you know, can that just fade away as they enter adulthood? Should that fade away? Uh, what, what, what do we need to do? I think some really interesting questions here. And then, of course, to pr promoting the safe and productive use of the Internet through education. We saw again and again during the pandemic that the that, that it ushered in unregulated use of the internet. So parents that probably weren't, maybe weren't even planning to let a, a say 10 year old or nine year old, you know, have unrestricted internet access where we're trying to sort of keep digital devices away from them, 
during the pandemic, they were often instructed, you know, hey, parent, you've got to have your, you know, your kids got to be online for a lot of to a lot of the day and make sure they get on these, you know, learning platforms and parents would do that and walk away. And we saw um, lots of evidence of children finding very inappropriate things on the internet, uh, whether those be things that they found very frightening, you know, just really uh, inappropriate uh, content, the form of videos, but video games and other things, you know, uh, content that was, you know, even marginal for adults, uh, the children getting their hands on. So it's sort of, you know, too, too much too soon um, in some instances. And how can we sort of avoid this uh, going forward? Um, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, we were supposed to have a little, little time for a question and answer. But anyway, that's uh, it for me. And we would be really grateful to have input on the declaration, um, these principles that, uh, that, that uh, we went through. So thanks, everybody, for all of your time. Sorry, that was a bit long, but uh, a pleasure being able to address you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I am just going to open the floor for anybody who wants to ask a question. Uh, just make sure to unmute your microphone so you can ask the question. I, I don't hear any. Uh, well, let, let, let me ask one, uh, Mark. You were talking about the role of the parents. Uh, that, that is a big concern to me. <clears throat> because uh, for several reasons. For, for one is because the parents may not be available at home. And the, the second is that they may not be cognizant of the technology. And thirdly, they are not very well aware of what the student is learning. So it would be hard for them to support them. Uh, so what, what are your thoughts about this? First of all, fully agree with you, Otto. I mean, this is, and this is why the, you know, we say these inequities were supercharged. You know, students with low educated parents didn't have the same opportunities when, you know, education moved over to ed tech into the home. And, uh, you know, that parents really struggled to support, uh, to support their students and often felt a tremendous amount of stress or felt like failures because they, you know, they, they understood the, that there's, there's, children might be falling behind as a result of, you know, their inability to sort of help facilitate this, uh, this distance learning that occurred. And, you know, what, what's the solution for that? You know, the, <laughs> the solution that we had was that you, you, you move learning out of the, out of the home, you know, the learning happens in a space where, where the people are, are, are uh, supported by adults, obviously having a highly educated supportive family gives certain advantages. But uh, really, honestly, Otto, I, I don't quite know what the solution is other than having a more, you know, a more educated society. You know, we have all these inequities right now that lead to different parental levels of ability to use devices and everything. You know, can we, you know, going forward, can we just provide better education to, to people so that there aren't these extreme inequities, you know, that you, that you see at home where everybody is able to use a digital technology productively, um, and that you know pays off benefits for for children. We often say in the UN that there is no greater investment than educating a girl. You know, bang for buck. You know, just in like strict kind of developmental develop development terms, educating a girl just pays enormous dividends. I mean, in terms of uh, you know her own well being and health, but also that of her her children. It's uh, you know an incredible investment. So can we can we really make those investments to ensure that the parents of the future don't have these uh, unequal skills? Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, it would be good if somebody else ask another question, please. Okay. Um, I've raised my hand, so. Um, Mark, you were referring about the right uh, to an unconnected learning and um, to promote safe and productive use of uh, internet on the, on the other hand. But how to overcome this situation if uh, we go again into a, a pandemic uh, situation or to... Uh, what ideas do you have? <laughs> Whoa. Thanks a lot, Anna. 
I was able to hear the question, a little echo at the end, but, um, you know, ideas for, ideas for, uh, you know, a, a future sort of pandemic situation. I, look, I want to say I'm, first of all, a global pandemic, it, it has happened in the past, you know, the, the Spanish influenza, but this was like, a, you know, that was 100, 100 years ago. And there have been, you know, there have been other pandemics. We would be naive to, you know, not think through what we might do in the next pandemic. But I've also noticed a sort of just flurry of activity that, you know, now the purchase of EdTech is not justified on it's making education better. It's not justified on it's making education more, you know, interesting, more engaging, more fun, more exciting. You know, students have better outcomes. None of that. It's actually being justified now on you have to have it. It's needed for educational resilience. There's probably going to be more pandemics. And to me, that's a, you know, that's, that's crisis capitalism. You know, that's you're preparing, you're just preparing for crisis. The better thing is to avoid future pandemics, of course. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I would advise against sort of re-engineering the whole machinery of schooling for preparing for the next pandemic, if you know what I mean. Um, but that being said, we would be naive not to think through, you know, how this might go better. But I think some things are absolutely clear. And that's, you know, one thing is universal connectivity. It's, it doesn't enable learn connected learning, but without connectivity, education at a distance simply, ca you know, cannot happen. And by connectivity, I mean, TV, what, you know, whatever your connected technology is, but if you're not connected, you cannot be participating in formal learning. But then to also think through the sort of structure of it, you know, is it is it really necessary to have people, you know, a 13 year old sitting for six hours a day in front of in front of tablets and stuff? Is that really what we want? I, I mean, I, I am open to the possibility that countries, Kenya, for instance, just froze its education system and said, you know what, there's a pandemic, schools are closed, that's it. Don't worry, folks, we're going to reopen them when this pandemic subsides. But, you know, there wasn't this huge stress. I see a comment. Uh, from the Philippines about, you know, parents were so concerned that their children might fall behind and my like, gosh, you know, get in front of your device and spend six hours and, you know, we, we can't fall behind and did you do your exam and all of this, you know, stress layered on stress layered on stress. Was that the right solution? Or, you know, maybe the solution could have just been, you know what? We recommend that you read to students. We're going to be doing some, you know, book depots where you can come pick up children's books, even books without, you know, any words and just pictures. It was great if you spend time with them. Politicians sort of imploring parents to do educated things with students in the household. And I'm open to the possibility that, that might have might have gone better. You know, that, that you didn't need this sort of frantic shift. Oh my gosh, you know, the the term learning loss is uh, driving me nuts. It's uh, I don't know what learning loss means, like learning falls out of my head, you know, like what, you know, it was a pandemic. Yeah, you know, learning maybe slowed down or some form of formal learning, but didn't mean people were learning other things, you know, <laughs> Let, you know, but learn, you know, we have calculated that learning loss of this percent equals this much GDP. I mean, I don't know, you know, what's anyway, so these kind of metrics that we use and other things. So I think we really need to think through them for, for another pandemic and also just be like a little more human about it. So that's my, that's, that's, that's my kind of off the cuff advice. Yeah, thank you, Mark, yeah. Mar <laughs> Marina McKaiske uh, raised her hand. Per favore, vai avanti. Stas punta, non ascolto, non ascolto. Rui, can you unmute her? Ma Marina Makaisik. You're muted. You're muted, Mar Marina. Marina. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, thank you for that presentation. That was just great. Uh, really interesting, especially interested in the declaration that I guess you're doing with uh, Dubai. And you said that more information, and thanks, Alina, for the link for that, that uh, there'll be more of a report uh, on that at the end of December. Is that right? That's that's when the report will be or the declaration will be endorsed. But we're we're accepting input on it until the end of the November. And you see there, there's a link for you to just you know write write your feedback and let us know what you think or you know ideas to improve it. We're 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 listening. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
Thanks a lot, Marina. Nice to see you. You're, it's you're, good to see you too. It's great to have, you know, I haven't heard your reports for maybe a year, a couple of years now. So uh, thank you for that. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, you're crystal clear on my screen. Anyway, it feels like you're in the room. I, nice to see you. Good. It's nice to be with you. Any Anybody else? Another question, please. We have a lot of uh, teachers in the room. I don't know, maybe they could give some inputs also for this conversation. I'd be great to hear from them. I, I really like hearing their perspectives. Um, can, can Ray, you Ray is raising his hand. Okay, Ray? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, two things that I, I just wanted to mention um to comment on about your presentation which kind of hit home for me as i said i have i have four kids myself ranging from 18 to to 11 and for for the eldest of them who's actually studying technology anyway so he has his his bat cave downstairs you know he has his computer set up um for him at the start when the pandemic started it wasn't such a change to actually start doing stuff from home because a lot of the stuff he would do online or on computers in school anyway. Um, but you mentioned also the social aspect of it. And that for him was the biggest change because when he would come home from school in the evening, you know, he would get down to his bat cave and he would do some of his homework and then he would play his games with his friends um, or, you know, do something for fun online. Um, that all changed after about a month because he no longer saw his little bat cave as his escape place anymore. He now associated that with work and with school. And so it was very difficult for him now to, to how should I say, to differentiate physically anymore. He used to, like he travels 45 minutes to school. So, you know, you'd physically change location from your home to your school and you'd leave school again and you can leave it in your mind, just like people who go to work, go to a physical office and come home again. Um, in his case, he found it really difficult and I could I talk to him about it. Uh, he no longer looked forward to going down to the room anymore because when he turned on his computer, it was he was thinking of school again and he was thinking of work again and he he had no longer had this differentiate this clear differentiation let's say i mean of course they overlap um they still overlap but the it was imbalanced for him and he didn't know how to to deal with that uh, and that was that was an issue so i was just wondering if you if you had any advice on that uh, and the second thing was just a comment um i translated a report here recently um from an educational institute here in Austria. And they did a survey to find out after or during this pandemic now, how to proceed because they, within two months, they had to put all of their stuff online, everything, which they pretty much succeeded at. Um, but of course they wanted feedback. And it came out that um, students wanted altogether a 60-40 divide. So they want 60% face-to-face with 40% online. So that was the end result of what came out of it. Um, now, having said that, that wasn't for young students, that was mostly for adults who are already working somewhere, but they wanted 60% face-to-face and 40% online. So I just wanted to give you that statistic as well. But yeah, I'd love to hear any comments you have about <laughs> uh, this idea of separating the school physically from, from the home. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ray, and I'd love to, if you can share that uh, study, it would be great to see it. We, we certainly miss things, but it sounds really interesting, that result that came in from, from Austria. Um, yeah, regarding the, the sort of separation, I, I think absolutely. I mean, that, you know, having the having a space outside the home for children is, uh, is really necessary. You know, we often look at it from the perspective, I mean, we're adults, so we look at it from the perspective of adults, but you know, adults were moaning endlessly, you know, my God, my kids are home all day. I can't stand this. Uh, you know, I didn't sign up for this. I've got, you know, two, you know, preteens and this is, you know, just intolerable. What was missed is it was also intolerable for the students. You know, they need a break from their family too. Um, 
and you know that that gets into you know kind of ha ha funny stuff but also i mean for for a lot of students school is a it's a place of protection you know what's going on at home is a it, it can be it can be really you know really bad or dangerous for students or abusive to students you know and school is a break uh from some of that and so I, I think the importance of having you know a place outside of the home the other thing is that you know schooling systems don't always like to say but you know schooling systems are an engine of acculturation you know they they teach things like nationalism that are important to governments and other things and if your education is just purely unfolding at home how do you build a kind of shared uh, culture, whether that be a local culture or a national culture? You know, that becomes really tricky because the home environment will be the cultural environment. Not to say there's not a culture of online spaces, but I would argue that it's, it just doesn't have the same pull and effect as a, as a sort of in-person experience does, especially a prolonged in-person experience like that, you know, year after year, day after day. Um, and so, you know, it raises a lot of very interesting questions. It's telling that around the world, I mean, homeschooling is is sort of illegal, if, if I may. You know, in a lot of places, you know, parents have to have very special permissions and reasons to do homeschooling. They need to have a, a teaching credential in order to, to, you know, have their students that are homeschooled. I mean, the, the state is alert to the fact that, you know, students need to have this sort of experience that you know brings them into communities and other things not to say the space of the school is always emancipatory or something but it's not surprising to me that your your son was feeling you know this uh you know also this new relationship to technology prior to the pandemic if you looked at studies of like what students liked about using technology they'd always say like it's exciting it's new we love it you know things would come out i i'd be willing to bet that post pandemic there's not going to be that excitement, you know. All right, hey everybody, we got tablets. You know, <laughs> for a lot of students in in wealthy countries, you know, that's just now that's like a learn, you know, about as exciting as I get in front of a keyboard. You know, that just means work, um, you know. But for for a lot of people, it had been a space of kind of play and uh, exploration and other things. I mean, it it can and should be both maybe, but. I'm not surprised that, you know, people, you know, you view your house differently when you're working at your house, you view your house differently when you're going to school there. Um, and so I think those, you know, those issues became apparent. We didn't talk about all the issues around, you know, the video lessons and students having to, uh, there's a lot of evidence students having to look at themselves, you know, in this chat, I'm staring at myself as well as staring at you you know, wondering why my hair is turning gray and blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> this was also teenagers were looking at themselves and led to all sorts of kind of problems, you know, but how odd is it that what, who decided that we need to see ourselves in a space like this? Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you could almost argue in the, in, in the book, I talk about like, it kind of be the equivalent of somebody going into a classroom and like putting a vanity mirror on every single student desk. You know what I mean? And you're just like, of course they need that, you know, like people are looking at them, you know, like I got to, you know, how do I look? Do I have something in my teeth, you know, but we don't have that in a physical space. Why do we have in a digital space? Is it needed? And I know platforms have made some adjustments, you know, when, when, when teams started off, I was really big. I was like the biggest thing on the screen and now I'm like the smallest thing. But <clears throat> again, you know, school systems are saying, hey, can you take off the, you know, so the, the students don't see themselves during these video calls. Nope, you know, that <laughs> didn't uh, didn't necessarily happen. Anyway, um, sorry that was long, Ray, but thanks for sharing your experience. Okay, well, very good. It has been my privilege to moderate. Uh, this Otto, Otto yes. there's a question from, uh, there's a question from Peter. Oh. On the on the chat, and uh, I I think it's okay, Peter. Peter, Sorry. can you hear me? It's in the chat. The question. I don't know if Peter has a microphone. Or not. Uh, he's muted, but uh, the question. Uh, uh, let's see. Is from uh, Peter Leon. Peter Leon. Let me see. Okay, he, Peter Leon says, uh, hi, Mark, thanks for a great presentation. Sounds like the report is based on what went wrong during the pandemic. I wonder if the advisory board also took into account about what went right, the success stories, 
If uh, so, can you please share some of these successes? Uh, thanks, Otto. I, I can try to be brief. Yes, there were there were successes, and we do uh, talk about some of them. Let me zoom in on on two that I think were very important. One was a lot of students with disabilities, both physical disabilities, but also cognitive disabilities, uh, found this. You know, the switch to ed tech was, um, you know, improved their education. Take for instance a student who's living in a developing country who is maybe missing a limb or, you know, is, uh, could have some sort of paralysis or something. I mean, the simple act of getting to and from classes was often hard or getting to and from school. And, you know, that the ability to sort of be able to sit at a desk and jump to and from classes was, uh, you know, <clears throat> remarkable. Also students with different, you know, audiovisual uh, um, impairments, you know, the ability to like really pump up the sound and you know, or uh, uh, other things to increase the size of text, you know, could could make the difference between students being able to, to, to see a lesson or not see a lesson or hear a lesson or not hear a lesson. So I think there's, you know, a lot to, to, to reflect on about how, um, you know, it allowed for sort of, in some sense, more inclusive educational practices. While there was lots of exclusion for some people, it, it became, you know, education uh, became more inclusive. Um, another group that I think had a good experience are, are frankly, students who um, found the space of the school to be, uh, you know, demeaning. They were bullied in some way. They were, you know, uh, an oppressed minority. They were, you know, uh, taunted at school. I mean, a lot of people have experienced, you know, the you know, the bullying and other things are really terrible. In my experience, a whole lot of people who are really enthusiastic about ed tech uh, often had very bad school experiences, you know, and they, they see this as like a different route that the other young people could avoid these horrible experiences they had in school. I find a lot of people who are in ed tech, they have no love for the space of the school. They had, you know, crummy teachers who didn't believe in them and other things. And, you know, the the, the digital space is different. It doesn't, doesn't, you know, often doesn't judge you quite as quickly. People can find, you know, communities that are, you know, sort of very niche and specialized and find kind of like-minded people in digital spaces. And so I think that there were some people who, you know, who, who frankly, they, they wanted and needed a break from, from school. Um, and that that was, you know, and a lot of reticence you hear from some of those places about people, you know, not, children not wanting to go back to school because of some of these issues. And obviously the space of the school, whether it be digital or uh, physical, you know, needs to be a, a safe and inclusive space. But I think we saw a lot of lessons about how, you know, people are finding the physical space of school to be problematic and that the, you know, digital aspects can help some of this. And maybe what Ray was saying about the 60, 40 balance is, uh, you know, <clears throat> shows that people, you know, find attributes to both. And that maybe the correct thing is a is a bit of a is a bit of a mix going going forward. Um, but anyway, we do we do point out some of the the successes. Those aren't all the successes by any stretch. Um, but I I also want to be clear eyed. I mean, we didn't go into this saying we wanted to look at everything that went wrong with the pandemic. We tried to use a very objective analysis, and well, I mean, we had no idea we might use a word like tragedy. But I think uh, when you read the book and confront the evidence. It's the right word. And there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn from it. I don't want to end on tragedy. Sorry, Otto. <laughs> no, that's, we end that's, on a happier uh, note, the, 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 the pointing us to, uh, to good, a good thing. Yes, place. of course. Well, OK, let me then finish with this. Uh, thank you very much. It has been my privilege uh, to moderate this illuminating presentation. I would like to thank uh, Mark West, uh, the Polytechnic Institute, of Santa Rem School of Education. Uh, particular obrigado a Ana Rui uh, pela organização. Uh, thank you again to the school for, for the website and please follow the, uh, the announcements for the uh, program on the uh, ISEN Santa Rem uh, Portugal website. You are cordially invited to attend the on-site conference in 2022 please check the ISEM website, that's ISEM.education, for the announcements about the time and the place 
of the 2022 conference. Uh, we are pretty sure that we're going to be in Santarém, but we have to accept or uh, after we talk to Anna, if we have it in, in presence in, there, and then we will announce it at that time. Uh, thanks for your attendance and participation. Uh, grazie per la, la, la sua partecipazione. Uh, obrigado por la participação nesta sessão. Uh, e uh, spasiba sa so, o caiasti uh, esta sessi. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> Hasta la próxima. Next time, tomorrow. Au revoir. 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 Au revoir.